Welcome to the South African Civil Society Information Service. I'm Fazila Farouk in Johannesburg. So, we're just a few days away from the ANC's elective conference in Mangaung, where the ruling party will elect its new leader. The media has been awash with news and analysis of the leadership battle between President Jacob Zuma and Deputy President Khalema Mutlante. It does, however, seem that Jacob Zuma will emerge victorious at Mangaung and be re-elected as leader of the party as well as leader of the country. And as Motlante faces the prospect of defeat, a new name is being thrown into the mix. Business tycoon Cyril Ramaphosa is being punted within the ANC as a possible alternative for the position of Deputy President of the country. And with us in the studio today to help us make sense of it all is Stephen Friedman. Stephen Friedman is the director of the Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of Johannesburg. He's a well-known public figure and a political commentator in South Africa. He has a regular column in the Business Day. Welcome to Saxo, Stephen. Yeah, thanks. Now, Stephen, when I first approached you for this interview, we talked about having a much broader discussion about the quality of South Africa's democracy, and particularly for Saxo's, the question we were interested in interrogating is, how do we make South Africa's democracy work for the poor? But it does seem a little bit out of step, not to, to some degree, engage with what's happening in the country in the run-up run to Mango. President Zuma is, is, a, is an individual who's been enmeshed in corruption scandals over the years. Um, during his presidency, particularly this year, he's presided over two crises in the country that have really laid bare the degeneration of South Africa's democracy. One would be the Limpopo textbook crisis and the other would be the overly uh, authoritarian response of the state to the strikes in Marikana. And then there's also this shift towards a more authoritarian and repressive as well as, con as, well as conservative state in South Africa. We've got uh, the imminent passing of the secrecy bill, the protection of state information bill, um, as well as there's the traditional leaders bill um, that's also going to be pushed through. Given all of these circumstances, how is it that Jacob Zuma will once again manage to be re-elected as leader of the ANC and president again of the country? Well, I mean, the short answer to your question is that, uh, you know, the preoccupations of the people who drive the national debate are not necessarily the preoccupations of people who elect ANC presidents. Um, uh, ANC politics, like any politics in, 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 in political parties, uh, uh, is governed by the way in which power is arranged within the party. People are members of various factions. Uh, uh, that is generally how political parties elect their leaders, and that's how the ANC elects its leaders. So I don't think the two have terribly much to do with each other. I think the interesting question to ask uh, is why in, in a country with the kind of inequality South Africa has, with the kind of problems South Africa has, with the kind of legacy South Africa has, um, the entire middle class, uh, including many civil society organizations which to be blunt, ought to know better, uh, have actually telescoped every single problem into this country onto the person of, of one rather mediocre politician. Uh, you know, I was reading a book on um, Indian history recently, and the author makes a very good point, which is he says, you know, all democracies are created by visionaries and then presided over by mediocrities. Uh, and he's probably right about South Africa as well. <coughs> um, that really is not, to me, the major issue in this society. Um, you, you talk about uh, the, the, the Limpopo textbook scandal. Uh, you know, to, 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 to assume that the Limpopo textbook scandal would not have happened if Jacob Zuma was not president, I, I think is to misunderstand uh, all sorts of processes in this country which create problems of that sort. Uh, I think to, to assume that Marikana would not have happened if Jacob Zuma was not president of the country makes the same mistake. So, yeah, Jacob Zuma has not been uh, uh, particularly in touch with poor people and working people in this country, but quite frankly, neither would anybody else in that position have been in touch with poor people and working position, uh, working people in this country. So it's, it's, it's very difficult to understand why what should be an attempt to deal with the very real problems the society faces simply gets telescoped onto one individual. Uh, the reality is that uh, Khalema Motlante is in many ways uh, uh, an impressive person. He's a thoughtful 
human being, uh, he's, he's, he's serious about governance. If Khanem Motlante beat Jacob Zuma next week, which is not going to happen, uh, just about nothing you're talking about would change because he wouldn't have a mandate from within the ANC to change anything. And it doesn't matter how thoughtful a person you are. Uh, if you don't have the political support uh, to do uh, what is required, you won't be able to do it. So, so we really need to go beyond this, this obsession with a particular individual and, and really talk about the issues in the country. Before we talk about much broader issues in the country though, I'd like to move beyond the person to the party though, because one of the questions I did want to ask you is that with successive uh, administrations of the ANC since our democracy, this problem of poverty, inequality, as well as unemployment is simply not being, being addressed. Um, yeah. Your views on that? Look, let's just quantify this to a certain extent. It, you know, the, 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 the statement is broadly correct, okay, but, you know, once again, very often we have a sort of climate here where, 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 where you point out that, you know, some things have gone reasonably well over the last 18 years and we ought to acknowledge that. Uh, there's a lot of scorn poured on social grants. Uh, I don't think scorn should be poured. Uh, poured on, on social grants. A lot of the scorn on social, poured on social grants is a middle class prejudice, quite frankly. Uh, it's assumed that uh, people who receive grants live in abject dependency, that they live hand to mouth from one grant, uh, grant to another. It's all nonsense, actually. People who get these grants very often use them far more creatively and far more intelligently to sustain themselves and sustain the people around them uh, than uh, the middle class people who are trying to roll out programs for poor people in this country. So social grants has been a major success in this country. Uh, if you look uh, at, at, at the figures which were published in the recent census, uh, you will see that there have been other successes in this country. Access to electricity, access to running water, uh, numbers of people in schools. Uh, all these are signs of progress. Does that mean that we have successfully dealt with poverty and inequality? Of course not. Uh, but it means that we need to have a more balanced picture. If you look at the census, uh, the real problem over the last 18 years has been that we haven't got to grips with the inequalities in the market economy. Um, so that in other words, if you look for all the messes in government, and there have been many messes in government, if you look at sheer physical provision to poor people by government, it's not a bad record. But if you look at the global statistics of, of income distribution, uh, access to jobs, access to opportunities, uh, then it's a, it's a dismal picture. And it's a dismal picture because we haven't come to grips with this question of how do we change the formal economy. Uh, and unless we do that, uh, then obviously the role government plays in this situation is that government is in a sense patching up uh, the wider inequalities in the society. One of the things that you've been writing about in your column in the Business Day Post Marikana is the role of business in uh, building a, a better democracy and a more inclusive economy. What role exactly do you see for business? You see, look, if, if you're concerned about poverty, you're concerned about inequality, you're concerned about social justice. I'm simplifying to a certain extent, but there are two, 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 two approaches we can take. Uh, the first approach, which many people take, is to say, well, look, let's just teach that, you know, let's just use power uh, and, and show these guys whose boss, uh, they're immoral, they're exploiting people, uh, etc. Okay. Now, however morally appealing that, that, that uh, article, that, that view might be to people who see gross inequalities and conspicuous consumption and all those ills in our society, uh, the reality is that if you look around human history, not just in South Africa, that's not how societies change. Uh, a lot of my academic work at the moment is, is precisely on how do we understand social change and what is real change and, 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 and how does change really actually begin to work for poor people. Uh, and my argument is that, you know, this idea that, that uh, people on the left had at one stage, that, that suddenly one day the people rise up and take over and you can suddenly have a new society, that's never happened anywhere and it won't ever happen anywhere because that's, that's, the way in which, that's not the way in which things change. The way in which things change is, is what one of my academic colleagues has called structural reform. And by structural reform you mean, we mean that power balances, if the right circumstances are in place, power balances shift 
towards poor people, towards working people. Perhaps not as, never as quickly as we would like, never as fully as we would like, but those balances shift. And if you want those balances to shift, then business has to be part of the story, whether you like business or not. You know, when you say that business ought to be taken seriously, it, it, it sounds a terribly conservative view of uh, etc. Et but uh, that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is that if you have a powerful constituency in this country, a very powerful constituency, probably far more powerful than the government, uh, and that constituency has the power to, to frustrate equity, you need a strategy to deal with that. And part of that strategy is about power, but also part of that strategy is about engagement. So to me, the view that says, who cares what business people think, it's just about organizing poor people and workers. I think that's a short-sighted view. Uh, I think that the capacity of poor people and workers to change their situation also depends to a certain extent uh, on businesses' response. So the, the process of trying to sensitize people in business uh, to the view that uh, you can have a for-profit economy which doesn't have to rest uh, entirely uh, on the kind of levels of, of, of conspicuous consumption we have here, that it doesn't just have to be about greed, that you can have redistribution. I think those are important arguments and I think those are important debates uh, to be had. Obviously, you're not going to win those debates simply on moral argument. Uh, those debates uh, w won't happen. Uh, unless poor people are organized. Uh, if, if I may, I mean, just from my own personal history, uh, I always tell the story of, uh, at a particular stage in my life, being a journalist and writing about the labor movement before the labor movement was widely recognized and engaging with business people then. Uh, and what happened was that when you engaged with them originally, their eyes glazed over. I mean, they weren't interested in talking about recognizing trade unions and bargaining with worker representatives. Uh, when the legislation changed, when the movement started uh, making itself felt in the factory floors and there were strikes all over the place, suddenly what we'd been telling them became terribly relevant and they all wanted to talk to us, etc. Now on the one hand you can say, and that's perfectly true, that they wouldn't have been talking to us unless workers have shown power. But on the other hand, the fact that they were talking to us created space for workers to consolidate their gains uh, and for workers to build greater power. So I think there's always uh, a, a dialectical relationship between the organization of poor people and the way in which we talk to elites. So for me, talking to elites is always going to be very important. Within the market economy, we have these gross inequalities. Uh, which haven't been sorted out. Job creation uh, is, is still a problem. Income inequality is still a problem. And to me, the solution to that problem, I, I don't think one can sit here and come up with some kind of magic recipe of, you know, tweak this and tweak that and it'll be okay. There has to be an engagement process. And the engagement process has to take a while. Uh, you know, when you talk about engagement process in this country, particularly among the elites, people think you're talking about people sitting in, a, in an air-conditioned hotel for three days and passing resolutions. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking, talking about a process of, 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 of quite tough engagement on these issues. But none of that will happen. And, and if we're addressing this to people who are concerned about poverty and are concerned about social justice, unless there's a strategy, and, and unless there's a clear strategy. And we don't have a strategy at the moment. Nobody has a strategy. It's perfectly true that the ANC doesn't have a strategy, but who does? Are you particularly singling out civil society, progressive well, I'm civil society? Out progressive civil society, I'm singling out the, you know, Kosaitu uh, has, has played an important role in the society in all sorts of ways. Um, but, you know, Kosaitu, with the greatest respect to an organization I've, I've written about over the years, uh, you know, is reduced in September to talking mystically about something called a Lula moment, which, which is quite clearly a fantasy in the minds of Kosaitu leaders. That's not a strategy. That's what you do when you don't have a strategy. So, yes, it is a challenge to say, I mean, look, for what it's worth is, uh, you know, I won't take you into all the academic articles. I mean, I'm writing this book at the moment, trying to finish this book on a a radical sociologist called Harold Walpe, who had quite a role in the development of South African Marxism. And, and, and based on my understanding of Walpe's later work, what I'm arguing in the book is that, that what we don't have in the society is a workable strategy for how we engage with economic elites uh, to shift the balance of power towards poor and working people. Uh, and until we have that, those problems are going to remain. 
we have, to put it very bluntly, we have a lot of civil society organisations who talk about the poor. We don't have a lot of civil society organisations who talk for the poor. Uh, and that's because it's very shallow. Um, you know, uh, if you look, for example, uh, you mentioned the secrecy bill earlier on. I mean, I'm sorry to be impolite, I think the way in which civil society has handled the secrecy bill has, 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 has been scandalous in various respects. The secrecy bill has been presented, quite frankly, as an assault on the rights of the middle class, the press, the activists, etc. If you actually bother to read the bill, and you're aware of the, con of the context of the bill, actually the people who are going to be disadvantaged about the, okay, by, by this bill are the grassroots poor. Nobody talked about them. Nobody understood why, how they fitted into the equation. Uh, and to me, that is a major problem in civil society today. We have the situation, look, I don't like to racialize things, things in South Africa, but in a sense, my, my overwhelming picture of the Right to Know campaign, and it, is, it, is be, it, it has been all over the media, etc. There is a particular photograph of Right to Know campaign activists outside Parliament recently. There must be 100 or 120 people there. Every single one of those people is white in South Africa in 2012. If you are running campaigns which can only get white people out on the streets in South Africa in 2012, you are deeply out of touch with 90% of your own society. And I think that that's a major problem. Uh, uh, I think that the act, the, we, we always complain about civil society in this country. Civil society is often very active and very vocal. Uh, but I see no evidence that it's in touch with poor people in this country, uh, that it's actually engaging with poor people in this country, that it's actually trying to make poor people in this country feel included in civil society. And quite frankly, until that happens, civil society will not have any impact on poverty, uh, because nowhere in the world do you actually impact on poverty unless poor people are part of the movement. And at the moment, poor people are not. But there's also just, broadly speaking, the middle class the sort of chattering classes in South Africa that kind of drive the mainstream debates. What are your thoughts on how we can build a stronger alliance between the middle class and the poor? Well, you know, the middle class here is a, a term which is thrown around, you know, it, it, it very often includes, uh, you know, people ranging from, uh, you know, investment and analysts in Sandton, <laughs> you know, through to some people in, in, in sections of the townships, etc. So it's a very amorphous group, etc. I think what I think the strategy that that uh, you know we really need to look at uh, a lot of my research work uh, uh, a few years back was on the treatment action campaign because I thought it was interesting to try to understand what that told us about activism on on, on, on justice issues uh, and and one of the things the teach for treatment action campaign has to treat us is that it's never an either or thing okay you never either have the middle class on board or you don't have the middle class on board as some sort of package you have to choose your issues and you have to build alliances around issues um, so you know i think it's a case of identifying what are the issues on which those alliances are possible. Uh, and let me identify one such issue, which was talked about in the Treatment Action Campaign, but which I think for a variety of reasons was an opportunity missed. I, I think that there are very interesting alliances which are possible on healthcare in this country. Because yes, we have, uh, for example, a uh, an appallingly insensitive healthcare system to poor people. I mean, the public hospitals are, are, are not good places to be if you're an ill person. Uh, and yes, massive resources go into the private system. But if you look at the way the private system treats people, and you look at the levels of dissatisfaction among middle class suburban people, about how they're treated by the private system. Yes, it's on a different level. Uh, uh, medical aids who won't pay out to people who are suffering from, from dread diseases, uh, people who get taken off to, to private hospitals with some sort of acute illness and you have to sign all sorts of forms before they let you in because you haven't, they want to make sure you can pay. Uh, there are all of those kinds of tensions which indicate that the private health system in this country is not working very well for middle class people. Uh, so certainly there are opportunities for talented organisers and talented activists to start talking to middle class people and saying, well look, to a certain extent this is a common problem. In your experience and through the studies that you've, uh, that you've done, can you refer us to any examples of democracies that are working for poor people? 
Well, if you're asking me to say, is there a particular country right now at a particular time which is some sort of model democracy for poor people? No, no. Well, yes, I mean, historically, that's an easy one. You know, if you were a poor person in Sweden in, in the 1930s and you look at what it was like, you know, they virtually, I don't want to romanticize it very much, but they virtually got to the stage where they weren't poor people in Sweden, which is a major achievement in human history. Uh, and that had to do with democratic politics and the way in which alliances were formed in democratic politics. If we look around the world today, uh, perhaps the best, you know, I can't give you one particular society which is, is a great model for poor people, but can, what I can tell you is that I can name you dozens of societies in which democracy uh, has been an important lever in the hands of poor people, has enabled poor people to make substantial advances. Uh, I was part of an academic project a few years ago, uh, an eight, eight country study, uh, Africa, Asia, Latin America. And what we were looking at are specific examples where, where citizen action had actually changed the balance of power in those societies. And in every single example, whether it was India, Philippines, South Africa, Chile, electoral politics mattered. Now, you've got to qualify that. You know, people say, well, what does that mean? You know, you're saying that you just find the right party and you vote for it and then you, your interests are looked after. No, of course not. But what we find in those situations, and that, that is the key to what I'm saying, is that when the parties are actually competing with each other and poor people get organized, it creates tremendous opportunities. Um, there, there's been a wonderful study of this, uh, a man called Partha Chatterjee who writes about Calcutta in India. Um, and, and one of the, the, the points about Chatterjee's studies, is, is because he, he writes about the slum areas of Calcutta, uh, is the way in which citizens' organizations, slum dwellers' organizations, very effectively play the political parties off against each other uh, uh, to make sure that they make advances and, and, and that they're actually uh, heard when they need to be heard. Uh, and I think that that's the lesson that, that, that people ought to take away. It's not a case of saying, well, if we got rid of the ANC and had some wonderful social democratic or socialist party that everybody would hap be happy. Uh, it's a case of saying if, if the, poli the more the politicians have to compete with each other, uh, the more big organizations really representing poor people have to see this as an opportunity. Uh, and it, it has achieved substantial results. I mean, let me give you one. So, I mean, South Africa, you know, may not look like a particularly promising area for this. Uh, in my study on the Treatment Action Campaign, okay, there are people in this society, people who are, who are living in poverty, people who would be dead, quite frankly, if it wasn't for political contest in KwaZulu-Natal and in the Western Cape because the activists were able to use that political context to ensure that people got the medication they needed to stay alive. And this is a very basic example of how, uh, whether you're actually in a context where there is electoral democracy or not, uh, can actually make a difference to whether you survive or not. Stephen Friedman, thank you very much for joining us today. <laughs>